everybody. It's good to be in South Africa. I've learned a lot in my short time here, and I'm sure I'll continue to learn more as the days go on. No, but we love it here. Um, uh, Fady and myself, um, it's truly a beautiful country, and love the food. We've had some great food, but of course the people. I'm excited to jump into the Word here tonight in a minute. Thank you so much. I did a little research on some words of my own. I'd like to start by sharing those. If this starts to go poorly, I'll stop. <laughs> so the things I've learned, uh, the bry, we're going to bry, okay. Yes. Uh, honk the hooter. No, not as much reaction. Um, lift up the bonnet. Change the battery of the car. Um, let's see. I'm about to eat some mints. <laughs> yes? Okay. Um, cool drink? Yeah? I'm getting some blank stares, so I'm not sure if there's... Uh, petrol, that's a pretty common one. Um, I got about 55 more, but I'm going to stop for now. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. No. I talked to somebody uh, who lives here before I came, and I said, hey, I don't want to look like too much of an idiot, but give me a little something to, like, connect. All right, well, I'm just going to share a little bit about myself um, and my story, and then we're going to jump into uh, Revelation chapter 4 tonight, shockingly. All right, well, I was um, born and raised in Buffalo, New York. Who's ever heard of Buffalo? Okay, a couple of you guys. Lots and lots of snow, so we have something called lake effect snow. You guys ever heard of that? Um, a lot of people in the States don't even know what lake effects. My wife uh, grew up in Florida. And she thought that snow days, where kids don't go to school because it's dangerous to ride the bus, were only in movies, and they weren't real. And then uh, we started dating, and she quickly learned, no, that's a very, very real thing. Uh, so we have lake effect snow because there's a couple great lakes on the coast right by Buffalo. And when the, I don't know all the scientifics of it, but when the storm rolls over the lake, depending on how cold or warm the lake is, it drops like uh, up to us, like 8 to 10 feet at some times within like, you know, 24 or 36-hour period. So I grew up around a lot of snow, um, and then I was saved. I gave my life to the Lord when I was seven years old. Did they have clowns here? The, okay, yeah. I don't know if they're really in the States anymore, not that I'm aware, because they're, like, they're really, really weird. Um, if, you, if you have a clown ministry, I bless that. <laughs> but uh, I was saved actually at a clown ministry crusade for children. I went forward and gave my life to the Lord when I was seven, um, you know, I said the prayer, and my, my parents were pastors and worship leaders at a church in New York, and so, you know, around the things of the Spirit my whole life, and then when I was 12, um, my dad came to me, and he said, hey, I feel like there's a spirit of worship on your life, and I'm supposed to teach you how to play the guitar, you know, which when you're 12, you're like, okay, whatever, you know, don't really care, whatever, um, but now that I have kids on my own, I'm like, how amazing to have parents who, you know, were in tune enough and prayed enough to even know to, to say that type of thing. And so he taught me a couple chords on the guitar, and really it was through, um, through music, through playing the guitar alone in my room for hours and, you know, writing songs and singing the scriptures um, that I began to get Justin Rizzo's own personal relationship with the Lord. You know, uh, it wasn't something that my parents did. We went to church a lot, you know, and it's, it's really easy, I think, sometimes for uh, pastor's kids or ministry kids to kind of not like the whole ministry gig because they've been forced to go there for their whole life. Um, but it's really became my own faith when I was 12. Um, and I joke with Corey Russell, who I think Corey was here last year. Some of you guys remember him. I'm not sure if he shared his testimony, but we'll travel together sometimes. And um, you know, he gets up the first night to preach, and his testimony is like so intense of drugs and all these bad things in his life. Did he share that with you guys? 
Yeah, so his whole message can be a whole, uh, his testimony can be a whole message if he wants it to be. It's so powerful. People get delivered. It's like so powerful. And then I get up the next night to preach, and we, and we travel together. And I'm like, well, I'm a homeschool kid from upstate New York. I sinned a whole lot, but my sins don't really preach that well. They're not really fun to talk about. I don't have the fun sins to preach about. Mine were just kind of normal sins, you know. I'm just kidding. Um, but the Lord began to, you know, speak to me that it's not better or worse, but that's a testimony in and of itself. And I think even, you know, some in this room can relate to that, where the Lord kept you uh, for a specific purpose. It's not better or worse or anything like that. And so that was kind of me through high school. Uh, you know, I was that good kid in youth group and the worship team and yada, yada, uh, which when your dad's the pastor of a small church, you know, you get to do a lot of things that you couldn't do at a different church, like lead worship when you're 12. Um, and I feel sorry for everyone in the room uh, at that time. And the next probably 15 years after that, most likely. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But when I was 16, a man by the name of Bob Sorge. Who knows the name Bob Sorge? Anybody? Okay. So Bob was a pastor in upstate New York. And about 23 years ago now, probably, um, he had a, uh, a vocal surgery. Uh, no vocal surgery is routine, but uh, there was a massive error that happened. And so now he can whisper for an hour a day like this. And that's it. So he raised his children. And that's even painful for him. So if you ever have Bob come speak, he literally does that for an hour, and then he'll write on a notepad to you for the rest of the time he's with you. He's written a bunch of books. Uh, one of his main ones is called The Fire of Delayed Answers, of how many times it's been prophesied that he'll be healed and working that out. Uh, talk about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, that's, that's intense. But Bob came to our church, and he, he spoke for an hour, and then we're at, sitting at lunch, and you know, he's writing on his notepad. He said, Justin, have you ever heard of the International House of Prayer? My wife and I live there. And I said, no, you know, what is that? And um, he's like, well, they do 24-7 worship and prayer. He's like, and I know that you love worship. He's like, you should go check it out sometime. And honestly, my first response was not, you know, the lovesick Davidic worship of, oh, my gosh, that's beautiful. I was more like, that's a little bit weird, Bob. Like, why would they do that? Um, it's kind of like, you know, why don't they do normal things or impact the kingdom of God in normal ways or go out of the four walls of a church, you know, like we're, we're taught at our church. Um, so, he, you know, he got a laugh, so we go back and forth, and he said, well, you just need to go check it out. Just go, you know, take a drive down and check it out. And so uh, another thing for me growing up is I hated school uh, with a vehement passion. But if you're in school, stay in school. School is very important. And it's very, very good. Um, I did not like it. And so college for me was always like a big question mark. Okay, Lord, what are you going to do? Uh, my, both my brother and sister had gone on to this Bible college uh, there in New York, and I was like, I'm not going to go to that Bible college. You know, the young, I'm the youngest of, of three. I'm like, I'm not going to follow in their ways. You know, I had a little bit of that spirit, whatever you call that on me. And so I was like, I'm going to rebellion? Someone say rebellion? What? <laughs> Just kidding. So I said, okay, I'm going to drive down and check this place out. So in 2003... Uh, no, 2000, yeah, 2003, I drove down with my youth pastor and a couple guys from the youth group, and um, I had no idea what I was walking into, and I remember uh, it was a Tuesday morning at 10 a.m., so, you know, middle of the week uh, when people should, like, be in their jobs, you know, doing normal things. I walk into this room, and if you've never seen IHOP or been to IHOP, it's a room much like this. There's a platform much like this with instruments and young people like you saw tonight who sing and just worship day and night. Uh, and at that time, they'd done it since 1999, so they'd done it for about four years at the time. So I walk into the, the back of this room, and my little 17-year-old heart is just overwhelmed with what I saw. I saw hundreds of people, young, old, pacing, walking around, sitting, praying. Um, you know, some people are working and uh, working on notes and doing different things like that. Um, but there was hundreds of people in this room on a Tuesday, and there's this worship team up at the front, and they sounded really good to the ear. They were really pleasing. But there was no uh, performance on them. Now, I think performance has its place, absolutely. I think the Lord can use performance in a powerful way. But their worship was so pure. And they were going somewhere with the Lord. And I was invited to engage, but I wasn't like, you on row five, sing with us, you know. Where like the eye contact during worship as I'm singing, how great is our God. It's like, wow, it's really awkward. Um, there was none of that. And so it really, really touched me. And then after a couple hours, um, so every two hours, we, we changed to a different worship team. Uh, and this is, you know, I come to find out this is like a real job because um, I went, went next door. We have a coffee shop there. And um, I said, hey, how can I get to be one of these people you know, who play? 
and uh, they kind of laugh at me a little bit, and they said, well, this is a, a full-time job. You have to do six months of our internship or a half a year of our Bible school uh, to join staff. The staff commitment is 50 hours a week. It's 25 hours of prayer and 25 hours of service. We have a human resources department down the road where you're going to sign in for your hours. And I'm like, this is like a job. I can, like, do this instead of going to college, you know. I saw my whole, my whole life just became clear at that point. And I went, I went back uh, next door to the house of prayer that afternoon, and I just sat down and I prayed, Lord, if you'd make a way, I'd give myself to this for the rest of my life if it's your will. Uh, super sincere 17-year-old prayer. Um, but, you know, many times the Lord, um, he causes us to pray things because he's the one who put the desire to do those things in us in the first place. And I think I'm like being wise and I finally found my calling. And the Lord's like, well, I planted that in you when I was 12 via your parents by teaching you how to play guitar. And you didn't really care at that point, you know. That's how the Lord works, you know. We can be so dull at times. And so I went home and my parents loved the idea of, uh, you know, co going there. And, um, you know, it is, it's an amazing place, and it's a, um, it's a beautiful place, and it's a terrible place is kind of the, the joke that we say. Because it's, uh, you know, I talk to people, and, and they're like, well, that sounds pretty awesome. I'd love to, to go 50 hours a week and do 25 hours of prayer. It sounds amazing to be in the presence of God that long. And um, we'll talk more about this um, on Sunday morning. But uh, sometimes it's, it's not so awesome. When you're, when you're there, when you're doing this stuff. And I, I tell people, hey, come and join staff for like a week and a half, and then I'll ask you what you're thinking, what you're feeling. Because um, as you begin to be in the presence of the Lord, uh, the fire of God, the love of God, the passion of God begins to press upon who you are. And uh, how many of you guys know when you're born again, when you're saved, uh, the Holy Spirit comes and he, uh, you're one, you're joined with him. But how many of you guys know you have a, a uh, spirit, soul, and body, right? So you're justified when you're, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, you're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit until the day of your full redemption when he splits the sky and you meet him in the air. You're sealed for God. Your spirit is one with him. And it's <clears throat> unbelievable to me. There's, there's people uh, in the body of Christ who believe because of that you can no longer sin. And they preach that. Uh, and then I've seen it go really poorly for a couple of my friends who began to dabble, and that's like, no, that's really not Bible at all. You have an incredibly unrenewed uh, soul and body that for the rest of your life, you're to be sanctified completely as the Holy Spirit, who's one with you, works his hardest to join with you to sanctify your unrenewed body and your unrenewed soul. So when you go and stand in the presence of God, and it's your occupation to pray, when it's your occupation to uh, bear the weight of uh, big, big things. Like we've prayed, like Linda mentioned, you know, for Hollywood, for example. We prayed for Hollywood for six years, naming the CEOs and the CFOs of Disney, of Paramount Pictures, of Pixar, praying for an inbreaking of God uh, in Hollywood. We've prayed for, against human trafficking and sex trafficking for years on Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. And sometimes you don't see the fruit of your prayer in the time that you think you should see the fruit of your prayer. Can anybody relate to that? In your own lives, um, you don't have to be a, a prayer missionary, obviously. This goes for all of us because we're all called to pray uh, and have that first commandment relationship with him. So it can be really, really challenging at times um, to, you know, stay the course and to get up and to lead, you know, another set and to engage. Like, I, I'm in the morning section, um, so I lead a bunch of 6 a.m.s, 8 a.m.s, 10 a.m.s, and so, you know, when I get up at 4.30 in the morning, number one, there's not too much good going through my brain at 4.30 in the morning. There's, like, nothing going through my brain except to get back in bed. <laughs> and I have to go at 5.30 and meet with 15 to 20 singers, musicians called my worship team. Uh, so I lead a worship team there, and there's 16 primary worship leaders, and we each lead a worship team of about 15 to 20 people. So my elevator pitch to people is I'm a worship pastor at a mega church. That's basically what I do. And there's 16 other worship pastors. And we all have our own little flock. But I don't want to talk to them at 5.30 in the morning or talk to anyone. I don't want to be spiritual and have to, like, you know, come up with something to say or even, like, this, we're going to sing How Great Is Our God today for the 10,000th time and act excited about it. So my drummer gets excited about it, you know. Um, so there's real challenges in, in the midst of that. But it, it's so beautiful at the same time. And um, the things that the Lord uh, has done not only in the hearts of the people there, um, but around the world through 
uh, the web stream. And again, you know, people aren't uh, joining in or watching a web stream to see a performance or a show. Hopefully they're engaging to pray with us and to carry burdens with us. And I love the way Mike Bickle says it. He says, the Lord has called him in IHOP Kansas City to be a fueling station for the body of Christ. And they're not interested, in, and Mike will say, he's not interested in franchising and getting 10,000 houses of prayer. He's not on the phones calling Russia and calling all these things. Hey, let's get houses of prayer going in Africa or whatever. It's a sovereign move of God. And Mike's really clear. The Lord has called us to do what we're doing here and bless and be a part of what's happening in the earth. So to be a, an inspiration that people turn on the web stream at 2 a.m. and they see that worship team. Well, they're still going, so I'm going to get up and pray, have my quiet time with the Lord or whatever it might be. Um, and it's been a, a place of personal transformation, but it's also a place of great sending. Um, so our HR gave us the numbers about a year ago that we've had over 16,000 people in our uh, coming up on 19 years of existence, over 16,000 people who were at one time on staff for six months or longer, who are now out. They're businessmen, they're businesswomen, they're pastors, they're worship leaders, they're CFOs, they're whatever they are, and they're going out. And so it's a, a gathering, a praying, and then ascending that happens. So that's kind of I, I hop in a nutshell. And what I want to talk about today um, is Revelation chapter 4, but perhaps from a different perspective uh, that you've heard it before. Um, I believe that um, we take the Bible uh, literal, uh, and it says what it means, and it means what it says. And so I want to look at it tonight uh, just for a couple minutes, and part two of this message will be tomorrow morning. Um, uh, at the tomorrow morning session. So who's ever read Revelation chapter 4 at least one time? Okay, who's read it like a couple, maybe 10, 20 times? Okay, a couple more of you guys. Who's like really, really been in this book for like a long time and like really studied it out? Okay, I see those hands. So I want to look at this from a, perhaps a different perspective tonight because when I, when I think of heaven, I believe that, yes, heaven can be manifested, heavenly things can be manifested through healing, through signs and wonders uh, in rooms, and it's happening on a daily, hopefully, a daily basis in your life and in my life. And we're going to talk a lot more, Fady and myself, over the weekend of how to do that in our daily lives and what that looks like. But tonight, I want to go to a 40,000-foot view, if I could, of this place called heaven. I want to look at this place called heaven. And we're going to be starting Revelation chapter 4, but I'm going to be saying a lot of scriptures tonight. Uh, and just for the sake of time, I encourage you to jot them down um, so you can seek this out on your own. Um, and if you don't see something in the scripture, I'll have Mike Bickle says this all the time uh, before he preaches. If you don't see something for yourself in the scriptures, I invite you to pray and wrestle through it. Don't believe something just because a guy on a platform says it. That's, that's been really helpful for me in my life of uh, 33 long years. Thank you. Okay. So first, we certainly do not know all that takes place in heaven. Amen? But there are some real clear glimpses that we see uh, into heaven. And if you're taking notes, you can jot down these four chapters. Uh, Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And then I would throw in Ezekiel 1, though read that with caution because it's pretty crazy. But I would say those are the four clearest chapters, Revelation 4 and 5, Revelation 21 and 22. So we don't know everything about heaven, but what we do know is clear. Heaven is filled, so pay attention here, with real sights, real sounds, real creatures, and real objects. As real as this table that I'm tapping right now. Although, although we're not able to see them right now, they're all very much able to be seen because they have a distinct form and substance. It doesn't change from one moment to the next like a hologram might change. I believe that the systematic unbelief and corresponding prayerlessness that we've many times seen in the church is one facet of the crisis is that there's a misrepresentation and understanding or a lack of understanding of our true heavenly reality, that we truly have a king. He's a Jew. His name is Jesus. Jesus is a Jew. He's not, probably doesn't have blue eyes. He's probably not European, white skin. Probably has darker skin. 
with darker eyes. He's a Jew. He's seated on a throne in heaven with the Father. There's a real dude up there. His name is Jesus. And after his death, uh, when he was, was resurrected, he came to his disciples, ate food with them, and then walked back through the wall like it was no problem. And then his disciples saw him leave, and he went somewhere. He's not a hologram. He's not swirling around in outer space, like, you know, killing time until he finally returns. Amen? Confidence and perseverance and intercession and prayer for your life, for a house of prayer, for the business guy who has prayer in his business, for whatever it is. Confidence and prayer comes from having confidence in who, not only who God is, but where God is. You're engaging in the government of heaven. So we say in America, there is one court higher than the Supreme Court. So in Washington, D.C., we have a Supreme Court. And I, I had a season uh, back in 2005 when I stood in front of the Supreme Court with a piece of red tape over my mouth that said life. Uh, I did a, a ministry trip out there crying out for the ending of abortion in our nation and staring at those pillars in front of that building, the highest court in the land. We silently prayed to the truly highest court in the entire world, the place where your God, where my God dwells today in a place called heaven. So let's look at it just for a few minutes tonight. This will be a quick glimpse into the heavenly reality. So verse 1 of Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. So for the, the context of this, this is written by John, the beloved, the disciple of Jesus. Most commentators say he's in his 90s. He's enslaved on an island called Patmos, and he's just there. The voice I heard speaking to me was like a trumpet. It said, come up here and I'll show you what, makes, what must take place after this. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read through all this, so I encourage you to do that. And uh, my, Fady and myself will look at this in a little bit more detail as the weekend goes on. So I'll just kind of paint the picture for you. So if you're a visual person like I am, so you can look up here. So John will continue uh, as he's taken up into heaven. And he says that there's a throne set in heaven. There's one seated upon the throne. And he says there's 24 elders around the throne. He says there's four living creatures. It gets a little bit interesting here. He says that these four living creatures have eyes all around them and within them, whatever that means, okay? Uh, this is just the Bible, so you can look at this on your own. And they're there around the throne of God. He said that there's seven lamps of fire burning. It says that there's a, a sea of glass like crystal. And God is in the midst of this. And I love, uh, someone said that these four living creatures, you know, there's not like heavenly sized uh, bolts that you have to screw into the chain around their neck to keep them there like dogs. They want to be there. They're not chained down. These creatures are gazing upon God with all of these eyes. And it says, whenever that they gaze upon him, they say, holy, holy, holy. The elders join in and they sing. They declare this song to God around his throne. That's mysterious. If someone did that in America or here in South Africa and your king said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get some unique looking creatures. We're going to pick 24 of you and you're going to sing to me all day. I would probably have more of a problem with that than I do with Trump right now. <laughs> okay. This isn't being streamed, right? <clears throat> okay, so continuing our, our glimpse of heaven. Uh, you can look at this later. In Revelation chapter 21 and 22, uh, we're still talking about describing this place of God's throne in heaven, okay? So in Revelation chapter 22, so follow the, the picture that I'm painting here. Remember, there's 24 elders, four living creatures, a throne, there's one on the throne. Revelation chapter 22 opens and begins to talk about a river as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God. And it's really interesting. Read it later. In Revelation 22, it says that this river flows down the great street. So if there was a street sign, it would say great street. Probably not. But there's a river that flows down the middle of great street in God's heavenly city. And it says that there's trees on either side of this river. 
And the leaves of these trees, I mean, it sounds like Avatar or Lord of the Rings here. Um, these leaves are for the healing of the nations. Again, if this happened in 2018, someone came to you with a leaf, said, hey, South Africa needs Jesus. Here's a leaf from the tree in God's holy city. Like, well, okay, who are you, first of all? What are your credentials? What are you talking about? This is God who set this up. It sounds like a Disney movie. You know what I'm saying? It sounds like someone just kind of mysteriously thought of, yeah, leaves sound good. Let's make them gold and flicker with lights or whatever, you know? It's like, but this is God. This is God's throne. God's heaven is, God's throne is in heaven. Is, uh, his throne is eternal. It is set firmly in the heavens. This is God's idea. And we'll, maybe we'll talk more about it, but I think Hollywood gets a lot of our, their ideas from um, God, or they're more tapped into the creator uh, in the false way than we are in the positive way, perhaps. Or the perverter, rather, that Satan can create. So in Revelation 22, it continues to paint this, this picture, okay? So follow me here, another great verse to get a glimpse into what is heaven. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 4, we all know the verse, when the prophet Isaiah, and there's a coal that's taken from the altar, and it touches his lips. An intense encounter. I'm not sure how I would feel about that. Go to the book of Hebrews with me. The writer of Hebrews begins to paint some very interesting things about this place called heaven. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Hebrews eleven thirteen. all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. So obviously this is talking about the hall of faith from uh, Hebrews 11. People who say such things show they're looking, pay attention here, for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have opportunity to return to it. They made a pilgrimage, and they were looking for a country. Verse 16, instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For what? He has prepared a city for them. God has prepared a city for them. And if you look in Revelation 21 that I mentioned, Revelation 21 gives this vivid description of a city, of city walls. So as we begin to put these pieces together, what we see in Revelation 4 and 5, Revelation 21 and 22, is God's throne that we sing about, we talk about it maybe, we're a little bit aware of it, is literally inside city walls, like a king perhaps, you know, in the medieval times or whatever, would have these large walls around their palace that God dwells within a city on a real, tangible throne, okay? Going a step further, in Hebrews chapter 12, one page over, Hebrews 12, verse 22, the author of Hebrews takes this a step further, and he's contrasting the old covenant, what the guys saw uh, in the days of Moses, is verse 18 through 21, if you're taking notes, you really want to get into it, but verse 22, 12, 22 is the verse that you want to read with me here, he begins to talk about what we've received as new covenant believers, blood-bought, washed believers in Jesus Christ. Here's what he says. But you, blood-bought believers in Jesus, which that's probably most of us in the room tonight, you have come to three things. Mount Zion, so he references a mountain. Yes, probably talking about Jerusalem, I understand that, in Israel right now, but I believe he's actually speaking of a literal heavenly Mountain. We'll look at some other verses for that here in a minute. You have come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. In Galatians, Paul says the Jerusalem above is free. What in the world is he talking about? Heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. So Paul, the writer of Hebrews, rather, seamlessly weaves these things together. He says, you have access to the mountain of the Lord, where God dwells with his physical throne. 
the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. What is this thing called heaven? What is this thing called heaven? So let's work back in our timeline of history here. Let's go to the, the book of Psalms. Look at the life of David a little bit. Again, we're still staring at heaven, heaven on earth, but heaven's a real place. In Revelation 21, it talks about a day when heaven, the city of God, because I believe those are synonymous, heaven and the city of God, they're one and the same, I believe. Heaven is going to descend to the earth in Revelation chapter 21. Heaven is going to descend and rest upon the earth. Don't ask me all the details. I encourage you to study it and then email me what you find. But it says it plain as day. There's all kinds of, well, where is it going to rest? Is it going to be, will the center be in Israel? Then go out. Well, if I do the math of that, it's over the Mediterranean. So that won't, okay, does that work? And then when things, bad things happen, is the earth going to shift, the tectonic plates, all this? Where is the city of God going to rest? I don't really know. But it's going to come down. It's coming down. If you die before that happens, you're going to go meet him in the air. It says in the book of Corinthians, it says in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the final trumpet. There's seven trumpets listed in the book of Revelation. And the seventh one, if you go read it later, that's a pretty good guess. That that's when you're going to be taken up into the sky with him. You're going to meet him in the air. But then you will be with him for eternity in his heavenly city, which will be upon the earth. Okay, that's not my point. So Psalm, verse 11. Psalm 11. It's very interesting here what David begins to talk about. Psalm verse 11, verse 4. I want to introduce you to a Hebrew word here. It's called hekel, H-E-K-E-L, H-E-K-E-L. You can look it up later. But I'm going to read a couple verses here that use that word. And that word in its root meaning means a large physical structure. Okay? That's important for you to understand here. Because David's about to use this word numerous times in, in the next couple of verses I'm going to read in the Psalms. He says, the Lord is in his large physical structure. Okay? So let's read a couple of verses. In verse 4 of Psalm 11. The Lord is in his holy temple. Heckel, large physical structure. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. The same meaning. Heckel, large physical structure. Go to Psalm 18, verse 6. He uses the same word. From his large physical structure, he heard my voice. My cry came before him. I could go on and on, but I'm not going to for tonight. There's about a, another half dozen times that David um, uses this word in describing the place where God dwells. Here's the problem. Are you ready for the problem? David did not build the temple. David had a tent that you could pick up its tent pegs and move around as David moved around Judah and Israel. So why is David referencing God's dwelling place as a large physical structure? If he never saw with his eyes, which I believe that he did, I can't prove that biblically, but I believe that David had real, true encounters with the heavenly mountain city of God, where God dwells, that caused him to say, one thing I've desired of the Lord, to dwell in his temple, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Perhaps he was talking about his tent that he would set up in his backyard whenever he would move, and he established singers and musicians. That's all a real reality, the Davidic tabernacle. You can read about it in the Old Testament. There's a lot of information there. But using this word, and speaking of it in such a way where it's a large physical structure. Because his son Solomon, after David's death, Solomon would come along. And he would build that large physical structure. And it was one of the most glorious things in the ancient world. So what did David see? What did David touch? I believe that David had access at different times in his life. And he literally went into the mountain, city, temple of God. So they're out of slavery. Moses has led the Israelites out of slavery. They've gone through the Red Sea. Things are great. And then they're at Mount Sinai, and Moses is called. He's summoned up upon the mountain, okay? And he's up there for 40 days. And the scripture talks about how a cloud, a thick cloud, descended upon this mountain. 
as Moses went up into it, it descended upon him. And there's another reference, which we're not going to look at, when the 70 elders of Israel went part of the way up, and they had a meal with God, and different things happened. That's, it's a crazy verse you can look at later. But for Moses, Moses comes down, and, re- and that's where Exodus 25 picks up. Okay, so the first thing that God tells Moses after he comes down from the mountain, are you ready for what it is? He says, I want you to build me a tabernacle, a place of meeting, and he takes up an offering. He says, tell the women to bring their gold, their jewelry, do this and that, etc. get all this stuff together. God gives three chapters of the Bible to the creation of the entire universe and cosmos. God gives three chapters, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, to the creation of the entire universe. He gives over 50 chapters dedicated. A lot of them are really boring to read, but you should look it, out, look it up sometime. He gives over 50 chapters in here of how to build this thing called the tabernacle. That's super interesting to me. God just didn't need to make the book thicker to get better sales. By you know, They used to do... Uh, used to give you royalties based on how many words you had in your book. That's why some of these books are so thick, because the guys are like, I'll get more money if I write more. God didn't have that issue. So, but when you begin to look at the detailedness, like there was these thick, uh, thick um, blanket type things, for lack of a better word, that covered the Holy of Holies, right? And they would drape closed. And um, uh, embroidered on them are creatures. So, there's so many fascinating details when you begin to look at it. But that's not my main point tonight. I want to look at a verse. Don't turn there, but in Hebrews, I'll just read it to you. The writer of Hebrews says this. This is fascinating. It says, Jesus is a minister at the sanctuary. It's eight, uh, Hebrews 8, 1 and 2, if you want to look at it later. In verse 2. So again, keep in mind, Moses just came down from the mountain. God said, build me a tabernacle. The writer of Hebrews. Jesus is a minister at the sanctuary and true tabernacle, true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. Verse 5 gets crazy. Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. God said, here it is, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So perhaps Moses wasn't just hanging out in Fadi's homeland of Egypt. Perhaps when that cloud engulfed that mountain, perhaps Moses didn't just stay on that mountain. Perhaps Moses had an encounter for 40 days with God's eternal city, God's true tabernacle, not erected by man, but erected by God. Perhaps. Perhaps. Okay, going a step further here. This will bring my point home for tonight. The very beginning to Adam. Adam. Don't turn there, but I'm going to read a couple verses in Ezekiel. I'll also leave this for your food for thought. The book of Ezekiel. This has been preached for years as um, Satan, the first worship leader in heaven, who fell. But perhaps, I'm just going to read it with for you guys and let you guys dive into it on your own. Ezekiel 28, you can jot this down. But just listen to hear what, what uh, the writer says, what Ezekiel says here. Verse 13, you were in Eden, the garden of God. So whether that's Satan or Adam, they were in Eden, the Garden of God, okay? Here's a great fact, an interesting fact, why I would believe that this perhaps isn't talking about Lucifer and Satan as the first worship leader who fell from heaven. Ezekiel continues to list seven of the 12 gemstones that were on the breastplate of the priests in the Old Testament. In the very next verse, look at it on your own. Again, he says at the end of verse 14, this is another interesting part. Again, this works. Satan or Adam, here we go. It says, you were on the holy mount of God. 
Even if you think this is Satan, there's reference of a mountain in the time of Eden. And Israel was very, very far from being established. This isn't Mount Zion. You can't just slip it in. No, that's Mount Zion in Israel. There's a mountain. Uh, in the middle of verse 16, I drove you in disgrace from my mountain. You see where this is going. I threw you to the earth, it says in verse 17. Very, very interesting, very, very interesting. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. This is speaking of Adam. Adam's getting his job description. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. That root word there is hak, H-A-A-C-K. It means set to rest. And it's used in the Old Testament to speak of the Sabbath rest. But it's also used in the Old Testament several more times. This word, tend and keep. Do you know when this word is used in the Old Testament? It's used multiple times in the rest of the Old Testament when speaking of the ministry of priests in the Old Testament, in David's tabernacle and in Moses' tabernacle. So here's what I want to propose to you for Adam, that he wasn't God's first farmer Joe with a straw hat and a piece of straw coming out of his mouth. And he said, God, what do you want me to do? Why'd you make me? To farm a place of perfection. Here's a further statistic for that. Before the fall of man, a product of the curse of the fall of man was that man would now have to what? Tend and work the ground to get his food. That leads me to believe that before that time, Adam could eat freely of food in a place of perfection. Perhaps he wasn't pulling up weeds in a place of perfection. So I believe that Adam saw, had access to what we read about in Revelation 21 and 22. That perhaps this place called Eden was in the eastern part of God's eternal city walls. It's in the eastern part of that because he was later kicked out through the, through the gate and angels are set there, right, to guard so he can no longer come back in. But perhaps when he lifted his eyes, he looked and he saw a mountain temple, a temple on top of a mountain where his God dwelt and lived. That perhaps Adam was the first priest of God. We're all called to be priests. And I believe this, to seek to defend the legitimacy of a priestly. Now, when I say priest, if you don't understand what that means, uh, it's from Revelation chapter 5. It talks about how we're, we will be kings and priests. We are kings and priests. And it talks about how the prayers of the saints are filling up bowls. So when I use the word um, priest, it speaks of incense from the Old Testament. It's basically talking about prayer. Okay, so we're all called to pray. We're all called to be priests, if I can use that term. But I believe to seek to defend the legitimacy of a priestly lifestyle is an idea foreign to Scripture because from God's perspective, to be human is to be a priest. I'll say that again. I believe to seek to defend the legitimacy of a priestly lifestyle is an idea foreign to Scripture because from God's perspective, to be human is to be a priest that the first human God made, we can actually relate to. I'm not into farming. Not really. I'm bad at it. You don't want to see my yard. But we can relate to the first Adam. You were made for a place called Eden, a place called heaven. You were made to behold a city with a huge mountain. And I believe on the top of this mountain is a temple that when God called Moses up and he sent him down 50 chapters later to replicate what he saw in heaven, he gave incredible attention to the details because God built his heavenly temple and he loves it. We are the temple of God. You have access to God no matter where you are, at your workplace, at your church, at your ministry, at your school, wherever it is. You don't have to walk 
into the four doors of a church building on Sunday or a house of prayer. But I wanted to, to start this weekend off by lifting our eyes from the hologramic moving place that maybe God is in control, perhaps not because the economy is slipping out of control. And I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm believing. We have to put the truths of God's word with our beliefs. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And I want to go a step further. It's not just getting that one, uh, our favorite Bible verse to meditate and make it on through the day. And say, I have plans for you, plans to prosper you, a future for you. I love those verses. I meditate on those all the time. But I believe God wants a bride on earth connected with a story, with a city, with a place, the place that he dwells. People go to Washington, D.C. all the time to see that house that's white. All the time. Yet how often do we as a church spend time thinking about where our God dwells? You don't want to get super, like, hardcore with it. You don't want to say silly things or whatever. You don't want to um, make this your primary thing. Jesus is the primary thing. But Jesus lives somewhere right now. It says in Hebrews, he lives forever to make intercession. Some days when I'm at IHOP interceding, it's depressing to me. I'm like, man, gosh, you live forever to intercede? And I, um, I believe the Lord spoke that to me one day of what that means, that even a million years from now, a thousand years from now, it's a little easier, well into eternity, whatever it is, a billion years, I don't know, um, that Jesus is still a priest? How does that work? Because Jesus is humble. You don't have to be on your knees uh, rocking God into abortion, send revival. God into abortion, send revival. You can say, Father, would you um, increase your glory in the Mediterranean? A thousand years, 2,000 years, 5,000 years into eternity, Jesus will be a priest. He's going to ask his Father for things. The same way he models for us, and I'm going to look at this more on Sunday morning, he models for us what it means to be a priest, to be connected to the Father, to be connected to him. So let's just stand tonight, and we're going to share one final verse in Acts chapter 3, as we, just, we can stand. I'm just going to close this in prayer in a moment. In Acts chapter 3, a very interesting statement is made. Verse 21, Acts 3, 21. It says, Jesus, or he, speaking of Jesus, he must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he has promised long ago. So he must, Jesus must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything. Okay? So if Revelation 21 and 22 in a city is a restoration when God restores all things, you can't restore that which, was never, which never was. You can't restore that which never was. I have this, uh, this movie idea, long story I won't share. In 2009, the Lord hijacked my life and began to, to get all these films and musicals and all these different things in, in my desire package because I was a worship guy, a prayer guy. Hollywood for Jesus people were weird. I had no desire. And then in a moment, the Lord begins to take me in that direction. I've done three full-length musicals, and we'll see what God does. But I have a film idea. And so picture with me. The, it starts off the opening scene, and you're way zoomed out. And the camera begins to zoom in, and there's a little man you can see uh, he's running next to a, a high city wall, and he's running, and he gets bigger, you know, as the camera is zooming in to this guy, and there's, you know, clouds, everything, you can kind of see him. He does not have a shirt on. He's very muscular, and he's running for his life. And then the, the camera quickly pans, this, like, you know, jackal creature type thing chasing him. That's what he's running from along this this city wall. And so he's running, he's running, and then the camera quickly cuts, and he's, he comes to a, a corner uh, in this wall where there's an indented gate, and there's two big wooden doors. And this man is running, 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 and he comes around and begins to bang on this wooden door. 
and he gets his you know, fingernails into the wall where he's bleeding, trying to get away from this jackal, but there's no way over the wall and the doors aren't opening. And then quickly the music stops, it goes to silence, and that same man sits up in bed, he's sweating, he's breathing really heavily, and the camera cuts to a woman in the corner who's making food. It's like a, a shack type thing. It's a small hut type building. And she says, did you have another dream? And then it quickly cuts and the, the story continues. And that story is of Adam and Eve. After they left Eden, the city of God, and the longing in the heart of Adam for nearness with God. And this story, this film will continue to tell that story of how you get back to Eden and how you get those city walls open. Of course, we all know the secret, don't we? His name is Jesus. And we have access. But you have access to more than just a healing, though that is our portion today, right now, in the supermarket. But you have access to the eternal city of God. The eternal city of God. Jesus, I thank you for um, just today, Lord. I thank you for each and every precious person in this room, Lord, who has gathered and set aside time to, um, to focus on you, Lord, to, to dedicate time to um, your word, to your scriptures, to you. Jesus, this is all about you. Jesus, this is all about you, and you are crafting beautifully a story. You are the most beautiful storyteller that's ever existed, that's ever existed. God, and you're crafting the story. And the Lord says tonight that you are a part of his story. You are a part of his story. Some are, are sitting in this room tonight and you feel so rejected and dejected and left out. You feel like I, I work my nine to five job or I'm going to school or I'm just a mom at home with my kids and you feel so detached from the story of God and the Lord is speaking to you tonight and he's saying you are a part of my story you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and when you close your eyes in Matthew chapter 6 and you go into your room and you shut the door I am there the father is there to meet with you and he wants connection Temple to temple, heart to heart, eye to eye. You have access to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus, to the Father. And hope deferred will make the heart sick. And I believe the Lord is, is speaking to a few in this room tonight, and he says, what are you hoping in? I believe that, that several the Lord is even calling to go on this journey of searching the scriptures, of finding out where the eternal home is. That all these men and women in the hall of faith, they died looking for a city. They were looking for a city. Their hearts longed for a city. And Jesus, we long just like they did. But God, we long because you are there. You're in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask for an injection of faith tonight into our hearts. Lord, I ask for a, um, a falling in love again with the Holy Scriptures, with the Word of God. Lord, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. Lord, I ask that, um, Lord, those who have even felt just such a blockage in their prayer life through the Word, when they open the Scriptures, it just seems so dull and so boring and they just want to shut the cover right away and then they feel shame and condemnation. The Lord says there's breakthrough tonight for you. There's breakthrough right now in the name of Jesus, of every depression and oppressive spirit. We break your power in Jesus' name and we say that the, the word of God and communion and prayer with God will become the sweetest, most coveted part of your day the sweetest and most coveted part of your day of opening up the Holy Scriptures, the living word touching the living God inside of me. My heart shall live abundantly as I faithfully seek your word. The living word touching the living God inside of me. My heart shall live abundantly as I faithfully 
read your word. Where we say, I will read your letters over and over. I'll think on your words over and over. I'll read your letters over and over. I'll meditate. We love you, Jesus. We want to love you more. And we want our hearts to burn within us, just like those disciples on the road to Emmaus. Lord, cause our hearts to burn. Lord, I ask even tonight, this first night of this conference, as, as uh, the, we go, Lord, to wherever we're sleeping tonight, God, that dreams and visions and encounters would take place in hotel rooms, in bedrooms, dreams and visions in Jesus' name. Lord, take us up in the spirit. Lord, show us heavenly things. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. I just want to end just by, keep your eyes closed, and you don't have to just if you don't want to, but just uh, just whisper this prayer with me, if you would. Just, at, just whisper it after me. Dear Jesus, I am yours, and you are mine. God, I'm far from perfect. But your mercies are new every morning. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for gentleness. Thank you for self-control. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who never has a bad day, who is always with me. Let the river flow inside of me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. While Justin was sh sharing the dream, the vision and had the movie clip, I just saw in my heart a picture of, of a lot of us, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the blood of, of Jesus, this door is, is open. We have a right to come in, but you, we are so used to living on the outside that most of the time we don't try anymore. We don't know we can come in. We don't know how to go in. We don't know how to find the door. Most of the time we don't even remember that there is a door. There is a place that we can live while we're here on earth, a place in the midst of God before the throne a place where the word impossible doesn't exist. A place where the word rejection doesn't exist. A place where you can look into the fiery eyes of God and be loved and be accepted. And that's the invitation for the rest of this weekend and I believe also the worship school. That will find the door again. That will, that will become more real than the chairs we sit on. That we'll see with the eyes of our heart and see the, the invisible and start to do the impossible with God. To live in a place of acceptance, acceptance, a place of, of mercy and grace, a place of perfect love, a place you were created for, the dream of God, a place Jesus died, but we can come in. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you, Lord, that, Father, you are stirring something up in our spirit, Lord. You are stirring, Lord, and, and Lord, I ask that that stir, that touch, that gentle touch, that, that small yes, Lord, that, that it will increase by your spirit, Lord. Father, that, that we can feel and experience again what it is to be hungry, Lord. To be hungry, not to be hungry, Lord, only for, for worldly happiness, but happiness, but, but Father, to, to be hungry for more and more and more of you, Lord. To be hungry for your presence, to be hungry, Lord, for, for your anointing, to be hungry, Lord, to look into your eyes, Lord. Father, that somewhere in our spirit, somewhere in our being, the cry that the cry that left in David's heart, one thing I desire, will become more than words, Lord, more than the verse we have memorized, more farther than the well-known passage in the scripture, but it will become the cry of our hearts, Father. 
It will become the desire of our hearts, Father. Will you please come? Will you please touch us, Lord? Will you please take us deeper, Father? In the name of Jesus. Father, I ask that you will keep everybody safe, that they will return home safe, Lord, and that there will be no crime, no accidents, Father, and that you will, Father, give your angels a Father command to protect us tonight. We love you. and You are worthy. You are worthy of our time. You are worthy of our money. You are worthy of our sacrifice, Lord. All the honor and the glory belongs to you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys.